Um, the next question we have uh, says, my uncle owned a farm. He allowed a person to stay on the property for the last 20 years. Recently, he, my uncle, passed away, leaving the house and the property to his brothers, who have decided that they no longer want the occupant to remain on the property. What can they do to get this occupant out legally? And how much would it cost? Bruno? Um, well, look, I think, so, so we have answered this question quite a few times. It doesn't... Uh, it doesn't change the nature of it. So the question is posed in a variety of different ways, but the the, the outcome is always you need to evict. Uh, that's the only way you can get someone off the property. So, you know, starting at the end first, eviction is the only way. Getting a court order, uh, getting the person to move out the property. Uh, that's the only lawful way of getting them out. So now if we take a step back and we go, great, well, are there grounds to evict? There's not a lot of information in that question to actually be able to answer that in detail because we don't know what the circumstances are. Uh, the property was inherited by the brothers. Um, I don't know how long ago. Is there an existing lease agreement in place? Um, I, I remember you mentioned something about 20 years. Um, he's been occupying for 20 years, but if, if the brother only recently passed away, there could be an existing lease agreement. If it's been 20 years since they inherited the property, different story because then... I, I doubt there's a lease because they would, they're the owners. Uh, there are such things as long-term leases. Um, you know, so one can always verify that at the deeds office just to make 100% sure. Uh, one also might want to verify if there's some kind of use of fract or right of habitation uh, because like somebody in occupation for that long, uh, you know, would you usually have some kind of vested interest? But short of that, uh, you know, if this person was just, fortuitously on the property, not paying any rent and just lived there and no one said anything, then yes, you would have to follow the eviction steps. However, and this is now the big one, and um, it, it's something to consider. So uh, I remember the word, like the use of the word farm, um, yes. and that now starts becoming a problem because pi is uh, like, it's not necessarily easy, but it's an easier way of evicting people, but it deals with residential properties specifically and the, and the occupation of residential properties. There's another act, ESTA, that deals with agricultural properties. And, uh, and you know, so what is the property actually being used for? How long have the people been, the farm workers been staying on the property? Because there they've actually got rights to that property and rights to stay on that property, even certain burial rights. So that becomes a lot more complicated. And unfortunately, the question isn't framed um, uh, broadly enough to, uh, for us to actually be able to, to ascertain that. I don't know, Silma, if you wanna uh, add to that. Yeah, I, I, uh, that's exactly where I got nervous as well, because 20 years and the uncle, I'm worried that he might be a little older than 65. So why this is, is, is relevant is exactly as Bruno rightly said, Esther, so Esther is, I, I think for a very long time, it was seen, Esther and Pai are sort of similar, but, but it's not. It's a completely different kettle of fish. Um, and and one of the requirements, so the requirements is the land has to be agricultural or uh, not agricultural, it has nothing to do with any um, uh, rural or very urban land. It was the farm now that threw me off, I'm sorry. Uh, but it has to be rural or very urban land that's not encircled by township. And very importantly, the reason why the people are there is the difference then between, uh, that's how we determine whether it's a pie or an ESTA matter, because if there was a contract of any sort, a lease agreement, whatever the case might be, it will not be ESTA. It can't be ESTA because ESTA's requirement is consent. And unfortunately, from the facts that I'm hearing, hey, Bruno, I'm hearing consent, unfortunately, way more than, than contractual. So as long as it was not contractual, it is consensual. And the problem with, with this is how you determine that is, Consent doesn't require counter performance. So this person didn't pay rent, didn't pay anything. If somebody has been in occupation of, of a property with consent, that's rural or very urban land, that's not into, encircled by township, and that person does not earn a salary of more than 2,000, uh, 12,000, one, two, and three zeros, 12,000 rand per month, they are protected by the provisions of ESTA 
And that person that's lived there for more than 10 years, over the age of 65, actually does have, as Bruno rightly said, an actual right to the property. So you don't evict in terms of ESTA. You negotiate in terms of ESTA for relocation and, and more often than not, the landlords only, pro uh, uh, not the landlord, the landowners, only, only way of getting that person off the land is to relocate him at his cost. Um, so it's it's a very unfortunate answer, Bruno. I think that's why you get if the very bad news to me, like you're gonna have to unfortunately pay um probably to to remove this person. Um so provide true alternative accommodation, not in the sense of buy alternative accommodation like municipality will sort it out. Unfortunately, it's a it's an actual relocation time. Sorry. That's horrible answer. Not this might be a, a little bit of a silly question, but would it, would it be the same case if, let's say, for instance, you had a group of people who had now moved onto the property, they'd been residing there for, let's say, 15 to 20 odd years, and now there was a community on the property. Would, would, would Esther then, in that instance, would these same facts apply? Depending on the, uh, on the exact facts, on time, and if the person was aware, if the landowner was aware of a growing community on the on the land it is deemed consent under ESTA so not five years in like five years and you get to the property and you're like oh I live I have neighbors I didn't plan on having um you, you can still get away probably with with an ESTA uh, with a buy eviction unfortunately if you if you reach a 10-year mark with the owner's consent uh, and knowledge it's deemed consent under under ESTA. All right, thanks, Olga. Thanks, Bruno. Uh, let's quickly move on to the next question, which says, uh, my landlord applied for my eviction from a property whilst I was out of the country. Judgment was handed down confirming the eviction order. I would like to have the judgment set aside, as I believe that had I been in court, the judgment would not have been granted in the landlord's favour. How do I go about setting this judgment aside? And is it possible? We've seen so many of these things take place. Uh, we are always on the other side of it, but like you get to see every trick in the book because uh, like everyone just has a special way of doing it. Um, so can a, a, an eviction order be set aside? Look, so legally speaking, yes, there's always ways of doing things. Um, you know, if you were in court, there's appeal proceedings you could follow. If you weren't in court, there's a rescission of default, ju a default judgment, default being the fact that order was granted in your absence, right? So yes, there is a process that can be followed in order to rescind it. That's, that's the simple answer. So now moving on to the next step, the question is, you know would you succeed would you be successful in doing this and that's a bit that's a bit of a tough one because to prove uh, or rather to make out a case uh, that you're entitled to rescission of judgment the court will look at a variety of things and typically that would uh, that would be things like willful uh, willful default so if you did know about it and you did nothing even abroad um, I've, I've been in situations where the person's abroad, but they don't bother sending one email, a representative, like they do absolutely nothing. And they come back and go, well, we knew, but we didn't do anything about it. And this often also uh, goes to the contents of the lease agreement, because the lease agreement very often does have addresses that you choose and email addresses that you choose. So if things are sent to that address, you've made no effort in checking that email address and you just prejudice the landlord by doing nothing, the courts will consider this and say, listen, sorry, but maybe you didn't know, but the reality is you didn't try either. And that's also weighed up against the merits of the case, which is now the second component of it. So even if somebody really truly did not know, uh, then the merits of the case might still sway the judge where he goes, listen, there was, you weren't will, willfully in default, but there's no chance that you're going to succeed with this. And the courts do look at the prospects. Um, and if the order is set aside, what the consequences of this would be, and, you know, whether you've actually got prospects to set this aside. And that then leads us to the question of whether you vacated the property or not, or whether the eviction order has been carried out or not, uh, whether the property has been occupied by somebody else, because the chances of reinstatement are slim, um, especially in cases like this, um, I don't see a court 
to, the court can't, in fact, sorry, the court cannot make an order putting you back on the property. Um, it's just it's just unheard of. Um, it's never happened before. If it hasn't been executed, different story. You can set it aside and avoid your execution if you've actually got grounds to do it. But yeah, if it has been executed, it's really a moot point. Um, you know, approaching the court is going to be like a very little consequence unless you're doing it simply because there's a component to that order that's still impacting you. So when I say moot, it basically means that the courts will consider whether there's any implication on you because it's not like this gets listed again at a credit bureau. It doesn't go anywhere. It's just a court case. It sits there whether you're right or wrong. The courts don't care about waste time on things however if there's for example a component there that deals with um let's say for instance costs that might be different because there if you generally do have a good good merits you generally did not know about it you're happy to keep, stay out of the property but these guys are trying to execute on you a different story then then there is a possibility of of success there i just want to i just want to clarify my my <laughs> one-sided reaction is actually because of what you exactly said Bruno the prejudice to the to the property owner is immense and I think we've seen too many cases where the landlord does everything perfectly right to get you that eviction order the the tenant is or the illegal occupant is in fact in willful default and eventually we have to sit back and wait for that order to be finalized uh, before the landlord can place uh, a new tenant again. And it's it's really a frustrating thing. So it's mm. more um, my deep compassion and, and empathy for landlords going through these long, costly evictions. And they're the guys that's doing it right and legally while I'm being less uh, diplomatic on this. So thank you, Bruno, for catching the ball for me. 